Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Pastoral Thoughts Podcast. This is your host, Jack Young, and today we're excited to have Dr. Bill Grady with us. And he is going to be preaching tonight. He just wrote a new book. Excited to find out more about that and look forward to reading it. It's a short book. It's only 350 pages, not like the usual 900-page uh, book. 440. Like, 440 pages. There you go. Uh, but we're excited about it. Thanks for being with us today, Brother Grady. Good to be here. Well, tell us a little bit about your book. Well, what do you want me to tell you? Perilous Times. Are we living in perilous times? Yes, we are. And I guess you're on camera, so that's the book here. And it's uh, volume three of a series I started back in 2005 with the first installment, How Satan Turned America Against God, and then... 2017, Volume 2 came out, uh, how, you know, Holy Ground, The True History of the State of Israel, and this is Volume 3, Perilous Times, Deep Truths for Shallow Waters. I got the title idea from a man in Alabama, an older man who preached the sermon on Acts 27, the shipwreck chapter, mm -hmm. likening that voyage to the church age. And it was one of the, one of the most beautiful sermons I ever heard. And he had two sons that were disease ridden from birth to chemical blood problems, you know, living at home mm -hmm. up to their thirties. One died two weeks before I heard him speak, died in his father's arms while he's feeding them Gerbers. Amazing. Home. You know, the other mm -hmm. one was ready to go to hospice in about a month to die. So I heard this man between losing two sons, small little dinky church in Alabama. And I was really overwhelmed with the power of God in that little service. Boaz, Alabama, he likened this shipwreck this voyage to the church age. And he said, how you can know you're getting close to the end of the age. And he gave all these points. Everybody's throwing everything overboard. Yeah. Keep the ship floating. Yeah. The closer you get to the shore, the more shallow the water gets. Mm -hmm. 20 fathoms, 10 fathoms. I have the measuring. You ask the people who've been saved 40, 50 years in your church. They'll tell you how shallow things are today. A deep, a deep truth for shallow waters. Well, that's the concept. And then, you know, and then, the most imp impactful thing he said for me was the close and the more shallow the water is, the worse the fishing is. Sure. Jesus said, launch out into the, the deep, deep to get a draught. So, you know, most preachers and dedicated Christians trying to be soul winners, you know, they're, they're frustrated that their results today. Mm -hmm. Well, back in the seventies, they were falling out of the trees, right? But you're in sh shallow water now and it's not the same. And I, I preached that sermon in Canada once over in Montreal and some French Canadian come up to me, you know, with a French accent, six foot two, 80 pounds soaking wet mustache. He had everything but a little hat <laughs> turned sideways. Uh -huh. And he said, Dr. Grady, I loved your sermon on Acts 27, but we must never forget the minnows. Mm -hmm. Amen. And that's what we're dealing with in shallow water. So yeah. that's where the title came yeah. from. Yeah, that's interesting. Now, your, your book, What Hath God Wrought, does it, uh, does it in any way tie in, or is it an out basic outline for um, how Satan turned America against God? Well, the same church where I heard this Alabama preacher mm -hmm. preach the sermon, the pastor's name of the church is David Sauls, and he called me a couple of months ago and told me he ran into Judge Roy Moore at a restaurant sure. there in Alabama, and the two of them talked about what if God wrought and for Judge, an hour. And Judge Roy Moore was uh, the judge who refused to take down the Ten right. Commandments. And one of his neighbors came to hear me preach once and then gave Judge Moore a copy of that book, What Hath God wow. Wrought. He wrote me a lovely letter telling me how much he liked the wow. book. And I got a letter from Jesse Helms one Christmas season reading the book. So it's gotten around. Yeah. And that kind of, that's not in the series, but it could have been. Sure. And at, that's basically the book that tells you how God set the country up. How Satan Turned America Against God details how the devil dismantled it. Yes. Holy Ground. Is deals with Israel now the only game in town on God's calendar, right? And then this book here is how to survive what's fixing to take place, right? And um, yeah, you said uh, Israel's the only game in town, so really your book has to do with the on Israel has to do with uh, the end times because Revelation four through nineteen you don't see the church in there, you see God zooming right in right. on the little nation of Israel, right? And that's that prophetic timepiece. And uh, but this is edification for the church yeah. in the end days, right? Perilous times, 
Deep Truths for Shallow Waters. And, you know, I wrote the other books. I mean, I don't know everything, but I spent 10 years as a teacher in a college, and I learned to read a lot and research because I really started doing that six, six weeks after I got saved. I was mad. I was raised Catholic in the state of New York. Cardinal Francis Spellman, the most famous Catholic in the history of America, signed my grade school diploma in Manhattan in 1966, graduated from the largest Catholic high school in the state of Delaware. Meaning when I got saved, I was mad that I'd been lied to so bad. Mm -hmm. So I started to study immediately just to catch up on what the truth was. And I was drawing the church history right away before I was ever called to preach right. even. So, uh, I, yeah, my, my, of course you, you and my dad were fast friends yeah, and uh, we're in Bible college together, worked in the steel mill together, and he remembers uh, very fondly you at the steel mill uh, reading Charles Spurgeon sermons like every day of the world. Preacher, there's a picture of me preaching in the steel mill. Oh, wow. In our lunchtime. That's awesome. Yeah, we were at an outreach ministry. But those previous books were more, I don't want to say academic, but yeah. they, were, they were like my desire to impart facts to God's people. You mentioned it, Jeff it, Faggart. He read What Hath God Wrong? Told me that turned him upside down to start his interest wow. in Baptist history. Mm -hmm. But this book here, and by the way, those five previous books were, again, transferring academic data to Christians about the King James Bible, Baptist history, Israel, conspiracies. But this book is written from a pastor's perspective, mm -hmm. not a teacher. And it's yeah. meant to edify the body of Christ and help them yeah. get through what's happening. Yeah. In those other books, you have, um, what would you say, about 100 pages of footnotes? Tons of them, yeah. How, of them. How, how do you do your research? I'm fascinated with that because you, you, you do a lot of research for your books. Well, you how, know, how, does that, uh, it, it, the, how does that work? The bottom line is you only have so much time, mm -hmm. right? So you try to cut the ring down by using the best sources you can find. Mm -hmm. That's where I always go. And you're collecting and writing at the same time? Yeah, may, always making notes. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the best sources will recommend then. The best sources. Yes. Yeah. You know, and, uh, you know, like in the new book, for instance, uh, I deal a lot with, you know, America and our establishment by our European ancestors, you know. And, uh, you know, this is where all these people that want to throw race in everybody's face every 24 hours a day with race cards. It's unbelievable. Yeah. And uh, they're always attacking, you know, white privilege, white uh, supremacy, and all this stuff. Well, I, I you know, I, I went to Yale University. The top professor, Paul Kennedy, he wrote a book called um, The Rise and the Fall of the Great Powers. He's the top academic in the top Ivy League school in the country. Mm -hmm. You don't get any higher than that. Mm -hmm. His bibliography section in his book is 1,400 books long. Good so grief. he read 1,400 books to write his tome. Now, my books might have four or 500 books listed, yeah. not 1,400. Right. And, I, and he's got a quote in there that says, by, 19, uh, seven, by 1914, European powers controlled 83% of the globe. Yeah. Now, Noah wrote in Genesis, one day God would enlarge Japheth. As prophesied. And then here you go. Here's... 83% of the globe, whatever, 84% yeah. of the planet controlled by Western powers. And then a great uh, mission store was open. The yeah. sun never set on the British Empire. Yeah. We sent missionaries all over the world. Uh, in 1972, I went to work for BOAC in Manhattan. Two months later, it was converted to British Airways because BOAC, British Overseas Airways Corporation, merged with BEA, British European Airways. The, one, the first was the international carrier and the other was the European carrier. And they formed British Airways. And that became, you know, the largest airline in the world, which, you know, matched that quote. Mm -hmm. I mean, the first line in the Beatles song back in the USSR says, flew in from Miami Beach, BOAC. <laughs> yeah. They, yeah. They controlled. But, I mean, I went to Yale. Right. Top professor. Mm -hmm. Ezra Stiles, seventh president of Yale, 1783, preached a big sermon in Connecticut on Governor's Day, honoring the governor of the colony. I have a quote from his sermon. Europe was settled by Japheth. America is settling from Europe. This is the second enlargement of Japheth. It's, it, it, let, me, let me give you an example. Back to, foot, back to sources, research. Mm -hmm. Look, the devil's crowd can only lie about stuff so long. You know, sooner or later they got to tell the truth. So here is a picture, Pastor. I don't know how they get it on the camera. 
But right here, I took that picture with my camera in a library in Knoxville, Tennessee. This is World Book Encyclopedia 2022 edition this year. Mm -hmm. Page 439 under the article titled Noah. Noah's sons were Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Shem became father of the Semitic peoples, including the Jews and the Arabs. Ham was the father of the Hamite peoples. Japheth was the father of peoples of Asia Minor and Europe. That's Genesis chapter 10. Yeah. The World Book Encyclopedia matches that. Yeah. You know, because the, the idea is the key, the key thread through this, the heart of this book gives a spiritual explanation for this racist you know, debacle. Mm -hmm. And that is, Japheth was, in, he's called, the key to the whole thing is where Japheth is called the elder mm -hmm. in Genesis 10. He's the oldest of the three. And anybody that had an older brother knows his job is to look out for the little siblings. Right. My older brother went to Sing Sing Prison in this state for three years for shooting a man in the police, on a police station front steps in Brooklyn, chased a man into the police station with the smoking gun in his hand after they shot him mm -hmm. in the hip. The guy mm -hmm. was messing around with his wife, you know. Mm -hmm. But when I was a little kid, nobody messed with me because of my big brother. Right. Well, that was J-Peth, the right. elder's job to get the gospel not only to his own people, but to his two siblings, younger siblings, Shem and Ham. Right. And that's why today American missions rules. Right. And last century it was British. Right. That's J. Pith getting the gospel around the world. Yes. Yeah. And people can't see it from a spiritual yeah. perspective. Yeah. And God used that. And uh, yeah, places like China, where in 1900 there was essentially no Christians, and today there's some 75 million uh, plus Christians. And I got you know. goosebumps talking to you. There's a picture of um, Madam Chiang Kai shek, and First Lady of China, and, and her husband, the Generalissimo. And they were both saved people. I got a picture. I made a video of, uh, of Madam Chang's life. And I have a picture in the video of um, her husband getting an honorary doctorate at Bob Jones University. And I, I was invited to come to her Manhattan, project, uh, Manhattan par apartment to interview her mm -hmm. when she was 105 years old. And I made this beautiful documentary on her life. And when I showed up to interview her, she died the night before uh, at 105. 105. But, 105. I, but I was invited to her funeral by the... Uh, the uh, the uh, head of the economic, uh, uh, if I stutter, that's my Joe Biden impersonation. <laughs> yeah. The economic forum in Manhattan uh, was the equivalent of an embassy, and I went to her funeral when she died. But anyway, that's right, Geronimo, he got saved. He wrote in his diary uh, in, at the age of 79, he said he was, on the he, he was in the dark and not on the right ro road, wanted to find Jesus. Shem, Amen. Shem, I yeah. Indian. Right. Here's the first lady that ever was published, the first black poet in America, Phyllis Wheatley. She was a slave owned by owned by some terrible slave owner in Boston named Wheatley, a, a, a tailor. And he took her to, uh, he and his wife taught her how to read and write, took her to preaching. She got saved listening to George Whitfield. Hmm. She wrote a book of poems called, uh, uh, Poems by Phyllis Wheatley. And she's the first black published poet in the world. And her, her most famous poem is called On Coming from Africa to America. Yeah. Tw Twas mercy brought me from my pagan land. Yeah. Taught my benighted soul to understand that there's a God and the Savior too, once I neither redemption sought nor knew. Some view our sable race with scorn. Their color is a diabolical dye. Remember, Christians, Negroes black as Cain can be redeemed to join the angelic train. That's As great. a black African, glad she yeah. heard the gospel in America. Amen. That's j -Pith getting the gospel to his siblings. And, uh, you know, there's the most famous photograph from the Vietnam War of Kim Pook. Oh, yes, yeah, she was running. Yeah, naked there. Yeah, there she is, she's a Baptist saved. preacher's wife. I, I've met her yeah. son. Her son uh, was going to West Coast yeah. Baptist College. He was on tour group, yeah. sang in our church. I sat at their dining room table when he was just a little kid over at Ajax, Ontario, Canada. Here's the guy that, here's the pilot. I don't, they probably can't see the picture. Buy the book. I need the money. <laughs> but there's a picture of the Captain Michu Fachita that led the attack on Pearl Harbor, standing there with his flight suit on, 1942. Yeah. There he is with a King James Bible in his hand, preaching the gospel. He got saved from the, a, a gospel track from Jimmy Doolittle's uh, bomber, no, Jacob, Jacob the Sager. 
And it, the two of them preach the gospel together. Two little daredevils. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, there's another Shemite. There's right. Shem and Ham getting reached right. through Japheth's enlargement yeah. as a gospel preaching you know, ministry. And really, uh, yeah, and really. Uh, People don't get it. Yeah, and really in uh, many ways we're at the end of Japheth, it seems like. Well, that we have you had the enlargement of Japheth. Mm -hmm. That's when Alexander the Greek, Great defeated Darius the Third at the Battle of Gargamel in 331. That's the first time a European power got control of the world. Mm -hmm. Persia was Shem, Babylon was Shem, but Greece was Japheth, mm -hmm. followed by the two Roman legs of iron. Mm -hmm. Rome follows Greece. There's Japheth. He's enlarged, but he's still a pagan. So... The Apostle Paul crosses over the, Mass the Aegean Sea in Acts 16 and lands over in Neapolis, which means new city. Three verses later, he leads Lydia to the Lord. That's the first European saved yeah, on Lydia. European soil. And now Japheth is enlightened. Mm -hmm. He's enlarged at Gargamela. He's enlightened at Philippi. And here's a spooky thing. The name Japheth means beautiful. You know what the name Lydia means, preacher? It means beautiful. Okay. What's the odds? How beautiful and the are the feet it. of them that preach the gospel? Mm -hmm. And by the way, preacher, if you look at where Paul lands in Europe, he lands in Europe at Acts sixteen eleven. <laughs> that's the Did verse. He that. steps, yeah. That's the step. That's the verse. He steps off the boat and at the entrance into the European theater. Cornelius is the first European saved, but he's saved in Palestine. Lydia gets saved on European soil. And then, but then, then he starts spreading the gospel, trying to spread the gospel. I just, this thing just went dead. And now, oh, there we go. There you go. I think it might have something to do with this cord right here. And so he's spreading the gospel now through Europe, the Christians, but of course, you know, the devil squashed it with the Roman government, then the mm -hmm. Roman church. Mm -hmm. And it stays squashed until we get the gospel over to this country. Yeah. And then it's, the hymn says, America the Beautiful. Yeah, they had the right Bible, but they did not have uh, Permission the freedom to preach it. Right. that we had in America when right. we founded this country. Right. It all fits together like yeah. a hand in a glove. It's very beautiful. Yeah. It's beautiful. It is, yeah. No, yeah, this country is an amazing, um, amazing tool in God's hands. Because you got Christianity came here, freedom of religion, which really was not a, not a thing until uh, America. Until the Baptist broke it open. Right. You got that other book of mine, of course, uh, How Satan Turned America Against God, and there's a picture in there, Portsmouth, Rhode Island, mm -hmm. where it says, Welcome to Portsmouth, established 1638 or whatever the year was. And then it says, Birthplace of American Democracy. Mm -hmm. And R Rhode Island is the most Roman Catholic state in the Union, percentage wise, of population. And here, they're, because it's tourism revenue, they they got bragging rights that democracy began there. That's right. But they don't tell you it's John Clark, the Baptist preacher from England, who was also a medical doctor who founded Portsmouth for right. on freedom of religion. That's right. why it's the birthplace of democracy. Yes. Yeah, I'm reading a book right now. It's called Democrac The Democratization of American Christianity. I think the guy's name's Hatch or something like this. But uh, after the revolution, anything that was establishment was overturned, like even uh, established medical science or professors or whatever. And this worked also in religion. So you had uh, groups like after the Great Awakening, the Methodists and the Baptists. Uh, you might not, you might be illiterate, but we know you're saved. We know you love the Lord, and you know got some of the Bible memorized. We're going to ordain you and send you out to preach. And it's like wildfire here in this country. Just uh, it was a wild west of religion in that spirit of evangelization. Uh, we started sending missionaries to every continent. Sure we did. The idea was God had our back mm -hmm. with the Bill of Rights. Mm -hmm. And, the, you know, and of course, the, you know, the most, and it's interesting, you know, those seven churches of Revelation. I mean, I was only saved three months when I read Harry Ironside's commentary on Revelation in 1974, talking about those seven churches, panoramic view of the church age. And, you know, the Thyatira letter deals with the uh, Dark Ages, a thousand years when the Catholics kept everything suppressed. One of the most amazing scriptures in there, Revelation 2, about verse 18, after the Holy Spirit's blasting the Catholic system, I'll cast her into bed with them with the committed adultery with her, and I'll kill her children with that, blah, blah, blah. Then you get right down and he switches gears and he talks to our ancestors in the Dark Ages. But unto you, I say, and unto the rest in Thyatira, as many as have not this doctrine, nor have known the depth of Satan as they speak, 
I will put upon you none other burden than that which you have already. Mm-hmm. Hold fast. Hold fast. In other words, that, that's the charge to our Baptist ancestors through the dark ages. Hang on. And the, you know, the, the deep thing is what they weren't told to do. They weren't told to have camp meetings, revivals, run bus routes. Right. They were just told to hang on. Yeah. And that's why one of, the more, uh, one of the most insightful pictures in this book is uh, any church, anybody listening to this tonight or the, at the moment uh, can just Google uh, Waldensian peddlers, like a salesperson, and you'll get this picture pop up. It's a picture of uh, two, two Waldensian missionaries trying to spread the gospel, and they're, uh, they are undercover. They're, they're passing themselves off as uh, salesmen, Merchants, yeah, here it is, preacher. You've seen it before, maybe. And you know they're they're witnessing to a rich couple, a nobleman and his wife, maybe somewhere. And they got the gospel, the scriptures hidden under the fabrics in a barrel, maybe. And they come out, and they're taking a chance to witness them because they appear to be open. Yeah. Because it was off with your head under the Roman right. boot through the Dark Ages. Right. So you you, you had the gospel, but it was suppressed. Mm-hmm. So. You know, the, the Japheth was enlarged, and then he was enlightened, but he was not free yet until the Bill of Rights in Philadelphia signed. Mm-hmm. And the Philadelphia church age opens after the Sardis age, which is the yes. Reformation age. And now God's got our back. It's because of the Bill of Rights. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's what... And here, all of that to say this. All of that to say this. I got goosebumps because I love talking to you, Pastor, because you're so well-read. And you're interesting to talk to because you care about knowing what's right and wrong, and very few Christians care anymore. But this all traces back to a verse in Timothy, in 1 Timothy 2. I exhort, therefore, that first of all, intercessions, prayers, giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings and for all that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceful life in all godliness and honesty. Everybody, every preacher just about today that reads that uses that verse to, 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 to exhort the local body to be sure to pray for your officials. Your elected officials. That's good. That's about all it is. Mm-hmm. But you got to remember, Paul was praying for a f- sympathetic government that we may lead a quiet, quiet peaceful, peaceful life, life so we could get the gospel out. Mm-hmm. Next verse, for this is well-pleasing to God who will have all men to be saved. Right. So he prayed that prayer, and he had his head cut off the next year after telling the Christians to pray that. Yeah. And it stayed that way. For 17 centuries till the prayer was answered with the Bill of Rights. And now a massive percentage of the body of Christ had a total protected government. And that's where world missions boomed. Right. And we were the shining city on the hill. And a lot of other governments uh, in some form or another copied our religious freedom model here in the United States. Well, the shining city on the hill was uh, was uh, the, 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 uh, the, the, you know, the Puritan there. Yeah, yeah. Mayflower. I mean, uh, what do you call it? Uh, Massachusetts Bay uh, Colony, mm-hmm. where they where they whipped Obadiah Holmes, you know, for having a pr- church service. Yeah. So yeah, that was uh, yeah uh, Benjamin Franklin's antagonist there. Um, I'm trying to think of the Puritans' name. There it starts with a W. Co- oh, a uh, Cotton Mather, Cotton Mather, yeah. and Weatherspoon, Increase yeah. Mather, and, yeah. and uh, the, the Mather boys. Yeah. Oh, that's right. Yeah. But the bath is broken open, mm-hmm. and it, and see, like you said, the wildfire. That's right. The bath has got the door open, and then it. It was for everybody could have the freedom now, mm-hmm. and everybody went scrambling, to, you know, to get the gospel. And, they, and, and uh, the spirit of the age there, the Great Awakening, and also during the Revolution, uh, there was a spirit of distrust the establishment. Sure. You know, if yeah, if you were from one of the old line denominations or you were some lettered man of authority, uh, you were not trusted. Well, George Washington sitting there in New York City when he conquered New York, sitting in... Uh, going to the Anglican church and the ministers up there pre- praying for Britain to prevail in the revolution with Washington sitting in the front row. <laughs> True story. Mm-hmm. He'd skip out of that. And he protested. He would protest silently. He would not take the Lord's supper and he wouldn't kneel when everybody else knelt, but he wouldn't say anything, but that was his protest. Huh. And when he'd get out of that service, he'd run down the street to gold Hill where I think where wall street is now that's where mm-hmm. I think there was a connection. Gold Hill was called. Okay, but that's where John Gano was the pastor of the First Baptist Church in New York City, and Jim Beller 
dug up some, who's in heaven tonight. He wrote his good book, American Crimson Red. Oh yeah, he dug. Yeah, he dug up somewhere that Washington would go out and listen to Gano sermons from the outside. You know, they had the windows yeah. open, and uh, Gano's in there praying for Washington to prevail. Right. Washington sitting in front of his own denomination, the Anglicans, mm-hmm. and they're praying for the British, the establishment. Right. And uh, and so when Washington is forced out of New York City to evacuate, Gano goes with him and became his number one chaplain. That's that picture we were talking about at the end of the war. Yeah. Washington has Gano pray a prayer of thanksgiving. And Gano was the one who baptized Washington. That's that break in the disestablishment. And, and so the, the, this this was the you know this was the golden age of Philadelphian period that we're talking about from the we would say from the the Great Awakening till about when what would you say if I would if I see I would chart I've changed my own opinion because these are just arbitrary right, dates right right, right. but the, the the one that makes the most sense to me now is dating the Philadelphia Church age mm-hmm. from the Bill of Rights that's okay. just one way I do it now from say 1791 mm-hmm. all the way up through to um, Oh, say 1901 when the okay. thing breaks down with the modern Bibles beginning in our country. Yeah, the modernists. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Criti- all, all the critical text period, uh, period, the German rationalists, all that um, theology coming in, the age of modernity. Um, and then, then there was a little bit of a pendulum swing back, whether you say the 1920s with the fundamentalist movement, all that stuff. Yeah, they made an attempt to, to uh, break away from the liberalism big time that was was growing. But again... It was a it was a Protestant movement, mm-hmm. and it was an ecumenical movement, and I mean it, it was the kind of thing where it was better than nothing, just like the Reformation. Right. The right. Reformation. Yeah, at least they're printing Bibles. They were doing something. <laughs> and they're right. trying to get a copy of the Bible in everybody's hand. But when you read the Sardis letter, which is the the letter that covers the Reformation era, yeah, it says, "Strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die, mm-hmm. for I have not found thy works perfect." They didn't break away far enough. Right. And that's the same thing with yeah. the fundamentalist movement. It yeah. was five things. Yeah, it was like uh, like Luther believed in sola scriptura as long as you agreed with him. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah, that, yeah. That, that type that's of thing. A, that's a good as one. As long as you follow our theology and our catechism. Yeah, the, the last line in the Animal Farm, all animals are equal. Some are just more equal than others. <laughs> that's exactly right. Uh, yeah, golden rule. Whoever has a gold makes the rules. That's it. Thing. Yeah, oh yeah. And, and so how did, in just summary, how did Satan turn America against God. So you have this great um, movement of evangelicalism and then the Baptist uh, movement and the... um, James Madison... James Madison, who who loved the Baptists, and he was the guy that wrote the Constitution, and the Baptist pastor, John Leland, made a deal with Madison on the the eve of the election in Orange County Mm -hmm. when they were electing delegates to go to the constitutional convention to decide if Virginia would ratify the constitution. And it was James Madison over Patrick Henry. Yeah. They were the two antagonists. Mm -hmm. Patrick Henry was against the constitution because there's nothing for religious freedom in it. Mm -hmm. I got a picture of him in the book right here, defending swearing Jack Waller, Waller, a Baptist preacher who's in prison. He defended Weatherford in prison, couldn't win the case. So he paid his fine out of his own pocket. Patrick Henry loved the Baptist. He was always defending them. Mm-hmm. <coughs> but <coughs> but so they get that Bill of Rights through with James Madison. getting ele- James Madison got elected out of Orange County because the Baptist preacher, John Leland, endorsed him. Mm-hmm. At the last minute, he switched. He was going to endorse a candidate for Patrick Henry's group. And he switched. And there's a park there called the Leland Madison Park right on Highway 20 called the Route of the Constitution that marks the spot where the where the John Leland, the pastor's home stood, yeah. where Madison lobbied him at that house. Mm. So and, when, and Leland pastored two churches at once. Two of the biggest churches yeah, in he the was country, out of, right? He was out of Boston, and he mm-hmm. came down there for a short time, and when he finished, he went back to Boston. Yeah. Like Philip was whisked away he was, when his job was done. And, and, and he didn't believe in separation of church and state. As far as far as the way that we're told, no, yeah. that's right. right. They, yeah. That's the whole idea. The government can't encroach on the church. But when Madison was dying, he left something to be read after he died. I mean, he said because nobody can accuse my motives if you, this is read after I'm dead. Wow. In my red book, How Satan Turned America Against God book, I have a photocopy of the document. It's called Serpents in Paradise. <laughs> I believe that's what well, what it's nicknamed anyway. And he warns America. My last advice to my, my advice to my country, I think it's called. I have a photocopy of it. I got it from the University of Tennessee archives. 
And he's warning America about serpents in paradise. God gave you something. Be careful. And the three base, you said, how did Satan turn America mm -hmm. against God? The mm -hmm. three main serpents, I think, were Roman Catholic immigration, the slavery issue, and the secret societies sure. that have permeated this country forever. And by the way, when I mention that, everybody thinks of Masons most of the time yeah. anyway. And as soon as you think of Freemasons, you think of George Washington. You can't talk to a Freemason five minutes when he's throwing Washington in your face. He was the greatest Mason. Get my book, How Satan Turned America Against God. Turn to the appendix section and look at the photostatic copy of the handwritten letter that George Washington wrote to a pastor in Maryland named Snyder, who was warning him about the, the Reverend Maryland thought Washington was in charge of all the Masonic lodges of the country because mm -hmm. that was the gossip and the yeah. you know the propaganda that Masons put out. So he writes him a letter asking him, uh, uh, more, uh, telling him about the Illuminati that's creeping into the country, and telling Washington use your influence through Freemasonry and warn America. The minister thought the Masons were okay, but the Illuminati was bad. Yeah. And Washington writes him a letter. I mean, you can preach. You got the book on a bookcase here. Yeah. You look at it. He says, I, Washington says, I wish to correct an error in your letter about my presiding over the English lodges of this country. The, I do not preside over any lodges. In fact, in the past 30 years, I have not been in a lodge in more than once meetings. or twice. Yeah. In 30 years. And he signed, and that letter's written 18 months before he died. Yeah. He was a Mason as a young planner in his 20s. It was the leg up everybody would start out if you're going into business. But yeah, un undoubtedly, our nation, when it was founded, there was snakes in paradise, and one of them was um, secret societies. Sure. We have Washington, D.C., it's the has more Masonic symbols than any other um, sure city on earth. I have a chapter in my house, Satan Turned America Against God book called The Battle for Washington, D.C. I was just in downtown D.C. two weeks ago. I hadn't been there for years. Sickest place you can imagine. Yeah. The traffic, the crazy looking yes. people. But uh, my chapter deals with the fact that there's all kinds of occultic stuff through the city and there's all kinds of scripture there. Yeah. It's a battle. Yeah. Uh, somebody said... Uh, the devil's always looking for a place to spit. <laughs> and America is basically the biggest spittoon Satan's ever been aiming at. Sure. And you go down to Washington Monument, 555 feet high, the tallest monument, you know, in this in the in the capital of our nation, right up on the top. Two Latin words, Laos Deo. Glory to God. Yeah. And then you got garbage everywhere else. That's right. Well, and it's the same thing. Um, yeah, we export the gospel, but we also export all sorts of filth at the same time. Yeah. It's a mess, bro. <laughs> yes, it is. It is a mess. See, so, so you have uh, secret societies, slavery and, I, and slavery Catholicism, and Roman Catholicism. The one, the Roman Catholicism. How, how did slavery mess things up? Well, how about uh, three hundred thousand dead people in the Civil War? Yeah. How about critical race theory today? It's still being thrown in everybody's face. It's a disaster. Mm -hmm. The blacks were sold by blacks in Africa, and the Catholics exported them and sold them and, and they come to America so they're available for labor so they're it's important. just a catalyst for problems yeah from man. the very beginning yes it is Jefferson said it's like riding a wolf right the back of a wolf by holding them yeah, by the you ears you better hang on to the ears you can't hang on to the thing and you can't let go right so we're and, so we're paying we're paying for that yes, today the sins are. of our fathers yes you are you go down to James Madison's mansion mm -hmm. and go look at the um, in Virginia go look at the names of his slaves up on the wall Noah Abraham Elijah. All, all biblical names. They, because they loved Madison. Yeah. They were treated good. Yeah. Compared to how they're treating in Booga Booga land, give me a break. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, this is stuff you're never going to get. This, You know, the Bible says having a form of godliness in the last days. So people are, are moralistic and religious, but they don't want anything to do with the God of the Bible. Mm -hmm. And so this race issue is constantly going to be debated over and thrown in yeah, everybody's it's, it's face. Really, it's really sick. I mean, there's, sure the, the most is. important thing about you, according to um, the secular powers, or the color of your skin, and then the gender that you identify as, or whatever identity you have. It's sick. It's really messed up. The other day... And the, the soul is not important at no, all. No, of course not. Smithsonian yeah. Institute the other day, on their website, said, if you believe in proper grammar, being punctual, the, the uh, nuclear family... And about 10 other sane things. Mm -hmm. If you believe in any of those things, you're a systemic racist. Right. That's on their website. It, isn't it amazing how they, they, they marry, you know, they marry those things together. Sure they do. Yeah. Yeah. I, you know, um, 
Freud believed like the most important thing about you was your sexuality. Karl Marx uh, believed that the you know the biggest danger to communism was the patriarchal family and the strong father figure. How about because that, that was a reflection of um, fascism, fascist government. Oh, right. And yes, and uh, you know Freud believed that government had to suppress sexuality, and so everybody is sexually repressed because you can't let everyone do what they want to do sexually or you have chaos. Yeah. So the best way to tear down a government is to have a sexual revolution. And that's what we see going on right now. That's what we see this month. Well, that's you why know, with, the, with the rainbow flags everywhere. If you want to trace um, the war in the Ukraine right down to a Bible principle, it goes back to a, a wimpy husband named Tsar Nicholas yeah. who couldn't control his German wife who was controlled by Rasputin. Right. Rasputin was the you know the Siberian monk that believed mm -hmm. in revival, but he said you had to have sin to have revival. So he believed yeah, he, in, yeah, he he believed in orgies. Sinner. Yes, he did. <laughs> I stood in the room where he was assassinated one time in St. Petersburg. He was, he, they shot him, they poisoned him, stabbed him, and shot Castrated him. Castrated him. Then they burned him, and then threw yeah. him. In, then they drowned him and yeah. found bubbles in his lungs. He was the most satanic creature on yeah. this planet. And you go look at any picture, you pull up Rasputin on your phone and look at his face, you'll see his eyes glowing at you. Yeah. There's nothing it is like wild. it. wild, yeah. But, it, but one, one sixth of the earth was the former Soviet Union, 11 time zones. Yes. All of that was turned over to Satan with the Russian Revolution mm -hmm. because of a wimpy husband. Yeah. Nicholas, who could not control his wife. Yeah. And she let, you know, she booted him out, sent him to the Russian front during World War One, and she and Rasputin ran Russia. With influence peddling and caused nothing but turmoil, you know he was having you know orgies every five minutes, mm -hmm. and that turned the tables for the communist revolution. It did, yeah, and that's yeah, why you a, got this today. Yeah, it was, a, it was of attack a on Christianity, husband. and it was attack on uh, the home and the family and the nuclear family, and we see the same thing going on in our country, maybe at a different angle, uh, going on right now. Yeah, it's definitely perilous times. So we're supposed to hold fast. That, that's uh, that's exhortation. That's exactly what it is. It, yeah, and if anybody's has a clue, I mean, the whole point of this podcast probably is to at least let you know about the existence of this new book. And we had five thousand four hundred books printed in the first printing. We had four thousand sold in the first four weeks. Amen. So you know, it's off and running, and it'll it'll bless people if they'll read it. Yeah, uh, Brother Vineyard preach a message. Uh, hold hold fast uh, sermon. And uh, young Timothy, that uh, you keep the faith. And you talk about when he was in the special forces and he was in Laos. He's up with the Laos. Laos, the name actually somehow means snake eater. Uh, so he was up in the mountains with these snake eaters. And they'd, they had talk about when they would find out that there was some sort of big boa constrictor in that area, that um, one of the guys would go and then sit on a log and he'd wrap his feet around the log at the bottom of it. And he would feign like he was sleeping. And he let the uh, snake, and sometimes it's taken an hour, the snake would come up and uh, smell him, you know, with his tongue and everything. And the snake would go to grab him, and he would grab on the snake. And then the snake would wrap around him and try to pull him off of that log. And uh, so he used that as his illustration. He says, you better get a good grip. And get a good grip on that log, get a good grip on that snake. And don't let go of those things. Hmm. Wow. <laughs> yeah. I hate snakes. <laughs> yeah, me too. They <laughs> like to eat them up there, I guess. Apparently they taste like chicken I, or something. I was right here in Alpine mm -hmm. in New York, you know, in uh, Alpine Boy Scout camps. Okay. <clears throat> Adirondacks Mountains. You know, I was a Boy Scout in New York City, St. Stephen's, 1965. I killed a copperhead snake. <laughs> I dropped, I, dropped a, uh, 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 I was getting water with a, a pole with two... <laughs> and I saw him and I dropped it on his head and killed him. And then we had a funeral for the snake. And I still remember watching the video, you know, the movie, you know, projector in 1965 in a Boy Scout camp, you know, headquarters. In yeah, that's great. Well, you're probably more scared of snakes now than when you were a boy, right? When you were yeah. a boy, you weren't as scared? No, no. Yeah, because I, yeah, I'd pick up snakes when I was a kid. And uh, yeah, my, like my son, Timmy, he'd reach down, grab a snake, snake will bite him, he'll throw it back down, grab it in the middle again, and it'll turn, like grab it by its neck, step on it. But yeah, that's, yeah, when you're a boy, you're a little bit. Uh, you said you weren't a scared. That's that's the way we talked in the city. We never said scared. We said us scared. <laughs> I'm a scared. I'm a scared of that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, that. Yeah, that's something. So go to your website, get the book, right? 
yeah, the website is Grady Publications, and we're going to be out. Of, we're going to be out of books probably in about two to three weeks, and they can't get a new printing till September because of Build Back Better. Yeah, there's you not uh, not the supplies, huh? They don't yes, have the paper and the binding, the glue. It's uh, twenty. It's uh, twenty five dollars and five dollars freight, and they're they're going out like crazy every day. You just get on the website, Grady Publications, and you can order with a credit card. But uh, it's it's uh, it's uh, four hundred forty pages, eighty glossy photographs, and it'll explain what's happening now and how to get through it. Mm-hmm. You know, have it's the first third of the book is all contemporary events. The second third is history. The, all the things we've been discussing about the how the Baptist, uh, how Japheth got enlarged to get the gospel to the world, and uh, you're you know you're right, preacher. <clears throat> it was Japheth was enlarged at the Battle of Gargamela when Alexander beat Darius. 330 BC, mm-hmm. Japheth was enlightened when Paul brought the gospel to Europe for the first time in 65 and 56 AD when he got off the boat at Acts 16 verse 11 there in Neapolis and led Lydia to the Lord. And then Japheth was enlightened. Pardon me, he was enlightened then, but then he was enabled when the Bill of Rights was signed in Philadelphia. And now he could get the gospel out. But like you said, preacher, unfortunately now Japheth is coming to the end. Yes. And the ending of JPEF is taking place before our very eyes now. Yeah, and yeah, hold fast to the things that remain. And the hold that fast that thou hast. That's that King James Bible. Mm-hmm. We hold on to it. We got it in 1611. We pre- preached it all through the Philadelphia age, and now they're still trying to strip it out of our hands. So we hold it to the end, just like a football player on the first and goal. Yes, yeah, it'll be interesting times. Our, uh, our Baptist Bill of Rights uh, seem to be... Yeah, that's slowly, not worth it. Slowly fading. It isn't worth You know, crazy Joe Biden, uh, you know, when, when he moved into the White House and the Trumps moved out, I was preaching in Amarillo, Texas that night at Charity Baptist Church, and I, uh, tore, I tore my jacket to shreds behind the pulpit, tore my shirt to pieces, poured a big bag of dirt over my head that I had hidden in the pulpit. I'd been to that church 10 times. They mm-hmm. knew me real well, but they were still looking at me like a <laughs> calf looking at a new gate when I did that. Yeah. And I was just lining up with Proverbs 29, I think, verse 2, when the wicked beareth rule, the people mourn. Yeah. I wasn't panicked, but I was mourning. Yes. And uh, it, and I tell the churches that I, I even have a weird connection to Biden. I may have told this when I was here last time. But in 1972, a man named Bill Stevenson and his wife opened a nightclub in Newark, Delaware, the Stone Balloon Ale House, and it became the most popular college bar in America. Rolling Stone magazine voted it the best kept secret in rock and roll, and I had a I got a picture of that nightclub in the book right here, because the quir- the quirky thing is I sold them their cash registers when I, I was 19 years old working for uh, Brandywine Cash Register Company in Wilmington, Delaware, and I made so much commission on that sale I went to Europe for four weeks with my boss. I got a picture of myself standing in front of the Vatican in Rome, 1972, from the money I made from that sale. But the kooky part about that was the owners, they were co-owners. They were both my customers Mm -hmm. on paper. They were known as Bill and Jill. Bill and Jill Stevenson. But three years later, five years later, it was Joe and Jill, as in Senator Joe Biden and Jill Biden. And, and, And Biden was fooling around with that gal when she was still married to her first husband, fooling around with the current first lady when she was still connected to to, uh, Stevenson. Yeah. And he's put, he's professing to put a tell all book out this year. Good for him, cashing in on yes, uh, Biden's is. Uh, election. Yeah, and the, so the moral of the story is if you steal a man's wife, you'll steal an election. <laughs> and right. once a crook, always a crook. Yeah. But uh, that's your current president and, fi- and first lady. Yeah, that couldn't be uh, couldn't be wilder. And, uh, boy, we, <laughs> we do live in perilous times. It is wild times. It's hard to, uh, you know, it's hard to believe your eyes most times when you watch the news or just see how rapidly everything changed um you know enemies coming in like a flood oh man yeah and then you it's it's amazing to see people like uh, i i saw a clip of joe biden here somebody had out you know and it was him it was during the bush administration and when uh, george w bush wanted to make an amendment to the constitution defining marriage between a man and a woman i think it was just a political ploy i don't really think he was gonna, ever going to really push for it he's just throwing um the you know moral, moral majority crowd a yeah. bone 
Um, but it was uh, it was Joe Biden saying, "What in the world do we need an amendment to the Constitution for? We already just passed they they j- already passed a some confirmation of marriage act or something like this." Yeah. And he says, "It's obvious, as plain as the nose on my face, that marriage is between a biological man and a biological female." And this is Joe Biden. And then you you know you take Barack Obama and Hillary Clinton uh, in two thousand and eight. They're both defining marriage the same way. So when are they lying now or were you <laughs> lying then, you know, and, uh, you see, you see society change so rapidly, so quickly. Oh yeah. And, Enemies um, coming in like a flood. It, it's uh, amazing. You, you mentioned the what if God wrote book. I wrote that in 1996. Go get your copy out go to the index and look up the name Joe Biden. See the quotes I have in there in 96 when he's talking about a new world order. Wow. With the United Nations. He's been a globalist puppet sure. all along. Sure. But, uh, you know, what else is new? Yes. Yeah. So, yeah, we, we live in perilous times, so we need a book uh, like yours and exhortation. Deep Truths for Shallow Waters by Dr. William P. Grady. Hey, thanks for being on. Thank you, Brother Jack. Appreciate uh, you very much. Yes, sir. All right. God bless y'all. Thank, thank you, everybody, for listening. Make sure you go to pastorjack.org and sign up for our uh, blog, our newsletter, and make sure that you go to, uh, well, you know, if you Google Grady Publications, Inc., it'll come right up and sure, you can order well. yourself a copy uh, there of Perilous Times. Encourage you to do so. God bless each and every one. Thank you so much for watching or listening to the Pastoral Thoughts Podcast. And we'd love to hear from you. Please reach out to us at pastorthoughtsmail at gmail.com. Also, if you want to check out more uh, about our ministry here, you can visit pastorjack.org. I do have a blog that I do write. I'd love to have you as one of my subscribers there. Also, if you enjoyed this video, please like, subscribe, and share. We'd love to hear from you. Thanks again for listening. God bless you.